if you missed uh, those of you on Facebook Live, Mallory just said we're on Facebook Live. Behave. So uh, good to have you guys here. My name is Jeff Dandridge, and I have the privilege of working with this team in the back, who are the conductor team. Round of applause for those folks back there. Um, appreciate you guys being with us today. We're going to share. I'm going to share with you uh, a presentation that I've done on a number of occasions, and I've, I've done a little bit of customization specifically for this audience. Uh, but we're going to talk about leadership and culture. Um, one of the things that we find in working with companies all around the state is uh, everyone wants to do a great job and create a good culture, being a good leader and create a good culture. But you, when you ask them what really goes into that, sometimes it's hard for them to really pinpoint. So we're going we're to dig into some of that. You know, most organizations have some form of a strategic plan or a growth plan or, or they, they, they plan their activities. They, they, they say something about their culture. They may have some core values on the wall. Uh, they have some form of mission statement. Uh, but it really doesn't matter. And, and if you walk, I'm trying to remember where we have this, uh, I believe it's in, the, in these stairs right here. As you go up the stairs, there's a big quote on the wall by Peter Drucker that says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So what Drucker's basically saying is it doesn't matter how good of a leader you are, how good your plan is, how good your mission statement, your vision is, your strategic plan is that if you've not consciously developed your culture, that it will consume the best of, of, of lay plans. It will just consume it uh, and keep you uh, from, from being on track. So the question that that then begs is what is culture? When we talk about a business culture, what is that? Or organizational culture? Audience for this patient time. It's establishing uh, expectations. Okay. Uh, expectations. An environment. The environment. Norms. Say again. Norms. Norms. Okay. You know, we talk in terms of core values a lot, and these are actually real core values of organizations that we've helped to create or helped them articulate. Uh, their core values. The ones up in the upper right are actually the conductor's core value. Do the right thing, take action, never trade results for excuses, go the extra mile, take care of each other, and have fun. Those are our core values. Those are the behavioral guardrails that we use to, to ensure that we treat each other well. And, and those are the things that we identified as a team that were important to us uh, in terms of how we treat one another. But core values are part of it. Your brand promise is part of it, right? That's brand promise is what your customers expect from you. It's the experience they, that they expect when they come into contact with you, someone from your organization or your brand. And we articulate our brand promise many times so that we can standardize that customer experience, right? So we standardize how we behave with one another in the term of norms and core values. If we standardize the way we treat our customers in the form of a brand promise, that goes a long way of building leadership culture. Uh, but when you think about culture holistically, and we've heard a lot of these, the shared values, beliefs, attitudes, behaviors that characterize the organization, the unwritten rules, norms, and social patterns that shape not only how we uh, interact with each other, but how we interact with our customers, uh, our, how we approach our work, how we make decisions. Uh, it's the collective personality. So really, everything has to do with your culture. The presence of process, the lack of process, an over-reliance on standardization and under-reliance. All of those things kind of work hand in glove to create the culture. Um, what I have found is that particularly in large organizations, you may actually have multiple cultures within the organization. But what I have what I have found in working with an organization like that is the more that you write it down and you standardize what's called your espoused culture, this is the culture we want to create, then the likelihood that you're going to have cultures in use that are vastly different will be less and less. So we would actually hire people according to the culture. We would interview people against the core values. We would share some, some behavioral examples and ask, what they would do in that scenario, or have you ever tell me about a time when you've done this or you've done that? Um, and so the more we talk about it, the more we select on it, the more we train on it, the more we coach on it, 
the more standardized we begin to have in terms of our culture uh, that we want to create in the organization. As we've worked with organizations in helping them develop and implement uh, innovation strategies, as we've helped them develop and implement strategic growth plans, we have found that there are six major elements that go into creating what I like to refer to as a culture of excellence. Strong leadership, clarity and focus, engaged and committed teammates, empowering communication, 100% accountability, and organizational agility. We're not going to talk about every single one of these today. Uh, I will kind of lay out what each of those six mean, and then we're going to dig into three or four of them more specifically. Strong leadership is about having a leader or a group of leaders who buy into that espoused culture, who buy into and live the core values, the brand promise. They treat people the way that, that the organization says is important for people to be treated. Clarity and focus is about knowing where you're going and how you're going to get there and being absolutely clear about that. Engaged and committed teammates are, are a team of highly competent people but who also have clearly defined and accepted roles, they accept those roles and they perform those roles with excellence. Empowering communication, communication that makes people stronger and more confident in dealing with whatever the, the circumstances are that they're facing. 100% uh, accountability is actually having, a, uh, having an expectation that when I say something to someone that I will do this by then, that I follow through on that commitment. And at the very first possible moment that I see that I'm not going to be able to deliver on that expectation, which happens, but I don't just, if I say I'm going to do something by Monday, I don't wait until you ask me Wednesday whether I've done it. If I, if, if, if I, if I wasn't going to be able to make that, if I learned on Friday that I wasn't going to be able to hit Monday, I, I tell you on Friday, if that makes sense. And then finally, organizational agility is the ability to renew, adapt, adjust, and actually, you know, take things, uh, take things on the chin and keep going. Uh, somebody used the Mike Tyson quote that says, "Everybody has a plan until they get, you know, busted in the face or something like that, punched in the throat or whatever, punched in the mouth." Right. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about leadership specifically. Many of you heard me talk before about the definition of leadership that that I believe uh, in wholeheartedly. I have it on my wall and. I'm, I've used this definition of leadership for, for a number of years, and that is that leadership is the most important requirement for business and personal success. In simple terms, it's defined as the willingness to be held accountable for results and then to deliver on that responsibility mm -hmm. no matter what the external circumstances situation to break. Whether it's being an individual contributor or whether it's leading a team of other people that willingness to be held accountable for results individually and collectively is, in simple terms, uh, how, how I define leadership and then being able to deliver on that. Uh, I shared uh, an example before of leading an almost a $100 million group uh, years ago, and, and we were forecasting to be 99% of plan for the year. Throughout the year, 99, 98, 99, 99, 99. And I kept pressing the team. Go, we, we've got to make up that other 1%. Finally, somebody said, 99% is an A plus anybody's book. What does the other 1% matter? I went, well, I'm glad you asked. On $100 million, that's a million bucks. That's seven people's jobs. Go out and tell them, if, go, you go pick the seven. Then you want to tell them if we don't deliver that last 1%, that they may not be able to put food on the table for their families. That's what it matters. So when we talk about 100% accountability, we're not talking about 99%. We're talking about 100%. We're talking about actually doing what we say we're going to do. And at the first moment that we recognize we can't, bringing that to folks' attention and saying, hey, can I work with you to adjust your expectations? I studied leadership. I actually studied high performance in the workplace, both academically and practically, for, for the better part of 25 years. Um, my doctoral dissertation was in studying high performers in the workplace. Actually, it was in the, in the healthcare workplace is where I started studying it when I was a professor at UAMS, looking at those top 1% of performers from the middle 50%. And by the way, the vast majority of the workplace is that middle 50%. So we have to have all of them. 
but there are very specific things that differentiate top performers from average performers. And so I set out to study that uh, probably 19, mid 90s when I started that. Um, Axiom Corporation learned of that research in the late 90s, around 1998, and wanted me to replicate that research inside their company with database administrators, software engineers, uh, 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 programmers, testers, et cetera. And so that led me out of healthcare into business where I did the same work with them. And people say, well, what did you find when you, when you looked at the differences between top performers and average performers? What did you find? And, and while we found a number of differentiated, what we call differentiating competencies, we found that if you cluster those competencies, they really fall into two categories. Competency, competency that enable people to deliver results and competencies, competencies that enable people to maintain, build and maintain relationships. And guess what? We all have a tendency toward one or the other. But true success, both as an individual contributor and as a leader of other people, boils down to the degree to which one can walk that tightrope between results and relationships. I'm a results guy. I'm a results guy. Fortunately, I was surrounded by leaders who could help me understand when I was not walking the results relationship type rope, type rope and could help me go in, in those relationships. Because you see, if I focus on results at the expense of relationships, I will experience wild success very, very quickly. Because results happen more quickly than relationships get damaged. But as I begin to alienate everyone around me who's helped me build and maintain those results, then I lose them both. If I focus on relationships at the expense of results, people will love me. They will love being around me. They will call me a great guy until they slowly begin to lose respect for me because I'm not dependable. And I can't do what I say I'm going to do when I say I'm going to do it. And ultimately, I lose them both. So it truly is a tightrope, if you will, of walking the balance between results and relations. And I actually keep a set of scales like that on my bookshelf in my office to remind me of that because I am, my tendency is as a results guy. Yeah, I can build relationships, I can maintain relationships, but when the pressure's on, I'm going to divert to results. Let's talk a little bit about leadership theory and just specifically in leading others. I've talked about leadership irrespective of whether you're an individual contributor or leading others. Let's talk specifically about leading others now. Years ago, there used to be this common management theory that made its way around and said that there are really three forms of leadership. There's authoritarian, there's democratic, and there's laissez-faire. Laissez-faire leadership, right? Uh, live and let live, I believe, is, is kind of what that is. But uh, the authoritarian, which is where we have uh, high degrees of control, low degrees of freedom. Uh, the democratic, which is kind of in the middle, moderate control, moderate freedom. And then, of course, laissez-faire, which is low control and a lot of freedom. And what we learned back when I was in the I don't know, eighth or ninth grade, however, however old I was when I first learned about this, was that uh, we were being pushed toward this concept of Democratic, that's a much better form of leadership. It's got the, the appropriate amounts of control, the appropriate amounts of freedom, and, and people just perform better when they're in an environment with this democratic style of leadership. Um, then along, oh, I don't know what when it was, probably late 90s or so, a guy by the name of Paul Hersey came out with, with this concept <laughs> called leader, uh, situational leadership theory. He said, you know, really, there's really not a best style. It really depends on the situation. And he said that there are two major types of leadership or basic groups of leadership behaviors. There are directive behaviors, which are both heavy on structure, control, and supervision. And then there are supporting behaviors that are heavy on listening, positive reinforcement, feedback, and consensus building. But he said the way you string those two together really depends on the situation. Uh, the directing is about kind of hand-holding. Right? The leadership provides specific instructions and supervises task accomplishment pretty closely. And then we move a little bit further over to coaching, where the leader continues to direct but may explain decisions and ask for feedback. Supporting, where the leader is more facilitating and supporting the accomplishment of the task, but the task is being carried out by someone else. 
And then finally, delegating where it's full trust, you'll take care of it. I trust you. Just let me know what you need from me. When you start looking at these and plotting them against this traditional leadership or management theory, they're really not antithetical at all. They're, they're kind of related. If you start all the way over here at the authoritarian, well, that's really directive. It, you know, and, and there's a time and place for that. The room were to break out in a fire. I'm not going to ask you for a show of hands. What do you think we ought to do? <laughs> I'm going to probably start directing you. The old paramedic in me is going to come out. I'm going to tell someone to call 911. I'm going to tell someone else to lead everybody out. And I'm, I and somebody else, we're going to go try to contain the fire. Same thing in the, in the military, right? Someone starts shooting at you. Show of hands. What do you think we ought to do? All right? Now we're going to go take the hill. We're going to uh, get under cover or what have you. And so you think about that, moving all the way from authoritarian over to delegating, which is the uh, uh, low control, much freedom. That's where we have the situation leadership. So people ask me, um, when, is, when is it best to use which style? And, and what I would tell you, first of all, is that there is no best style. It's dependent. Number one, it's different strokes for different folks. Because guess what? The way Grace needs to be led, the way Jeff needs to be led, the way Erica or Caitlin needs to be led, we're all different human, human beings. We're all different individuals. And so we each need different types of leadership, different types of communication in order for us to be optimally effective. So it's different strokes for different folks, right? But it's also different strokes for the same folks because my comfort and confidence and competence in performing the task might be lower than Grace's. So I might need, need more direction than Grace does, and she might need less direction because she's much more confident with a particular task. And oh, by the way, it might even be a situation where uh, when I'm working with the same leader, in one instance, I need to be directed because I'm very uh, uh, incompetent at performing that task. But in another task, you can delegate to me because I'm very competent at performing that task. And I've used the examples before of working for a department chair at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, where she wanted me to take over the recruitment process, recruitment selection of, of, of students for our respiratory therapy program. And so one year she directed, the next year she coached and supported, the third year she delegated. But in the third year, she came back and had me actually take over the budget process. She couldn't delegate that to me because I wasn't as competent. But she didn't have to revert back and start directing me on the uh, recruitment process just because she needed to direct me on the budgeting process. So she was using multiple leadership styles with me dependent upon the situation. Make sense? What we're really looking at is looking something like this. When, whoop, back it up. When the competence of the individual performing the task or the confidence of the leader in the competence of the person performing the task. Because there be times when I feel like I'm completely confident and I just tell the leader, hey, just delegate to me. Let me run with it. And she might say, oh, well, she might not say, I'm not as confident in your competence as you are in your competence. But she would kind of demonstrate that to me by saying, well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you go perform the first three or four tasks? Then let's sit down and have a touch base and see where you are. And then go perform the next several tasks, what have you. So the competence of the individual and the confidence of the leader and the level of risk to the organization, right? What's the level of risk if the place breaks out in a fire? It's high. So forget about, I'm not going to ask you about your confidence because the risks are so high, it's more important to save people's lives. So I'm not going to ask. But in other instances, the risk may only be high because your confidence is low. In that instance, I need to understand what the circumstances are. Questions, comments, thoughts, experiences maybe that you have working with, that, with folks? People ask me, well, how do you know which one to use? And, and my response is always, you ask. You say, what kind of leadership do you need from me? And if they demonstrate to you that they're very comfortable and competent, and you feel very comfortable that they're competent, then maybe you choose to delegate. If you're not quite sure, 
Maybe you choose to use that coaching and supporting and give them a little bit of rope and then say, let's touch base after a couple of three weeks and see where you are. Or you might say, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you go put your plan together for how you're going to approach it? And why don't you uh, uh, put a timeline along with it? And then why don't we sit down in a week or so and let's look at that plan? And I might reserve judgment on their confidence and my confidence until I see that plan. And that plan could tell me whether or not they're confident. Make sense? So the point is, it happens with communication. You just ask. And then you kind of verbally contract with one another on the type of leadership that you're going to provide. That way, they know what to expect. They don't feel they're micromanaged because you've agreed on the front end how much rope they're going to be given, so to speak. So that's situational leadership. We talked about leadership in terms of individual contributors. We talked about leadership in terms of leading others. Situational leadership. Now let's talk about this concept of 100% accountability. I used to have a bias that one of the roles of a leader was to hold his people or her people accountable. It was an act of assertion. A leader had to be assertive because I got to hold I got to hold my people accountable. And granted, there may be some instances where you have to do that as a leader. I would say if you believe that that is a primary role of leadership, then you'll probably believe you have to do it more than you actually do. <laughs> but I've come back to this belief over the last few years that leadership is better, or accountability rather, is better as an act of, uh, uh, as an act of submission, where I submit myself as the leader to being held accountable by the folks I'm responsible for leading and my colleagues across the organization. And as a result, that contributes to a culture where other people feel safe submitting themselves to being held accountable as well. So I like to think about accountability as an act of submission versus an act of assertion when it comes to leadership. Not saying you don't have to be assertive and assert leadership to hold people accountable on occasion. But if we focus on submitting ourselves to being held accountable, the number of times we have to assert ourselves is fewer and farther between. Anybody have thought of that? I've got a quick question, Jeff. Yes, sir. So right now we use OKRs and what we've been doing is we've been trying to set really high goals. And then if we hit 70%, we can put everybody in money and green and say that's okay. Okay. How do I I like the 100 percent idea? How do I transition from that to 100 percent Well, one question would be asking your team. Hey guys, what do y'all feel about that? How do y'all feel about 70%? Because it's a low C. On, on, on an academic scale. Yeah. It's not wrong. It's not like still like really high goals, like almost on the team. Okay. Do we need to lower the goals to where we can hit 100%? Well, I, I, so that's a good question. What I would do is I would probably do some analysis first on what is it that's that's keeping you from getting to 100%. Okay. Right. And if there are repetitive things, so when we talk about, by the way, tomorrow I'll be in Moralton talking about um, strategic growth planning. And you're welcome to join us. And there we'll be talking about this concept of when you build a strategic growth plan and you have annual targets, annual short-term goals, it usually takes about 90 days, 90 to 100 days for an organization to lose focus on those 12-month goals and kind of get off track, right? Uh, they just don't put the, the same amount of focus on them in, in day 99 as they did in day nine. And so we like to use uh, this concept that, that Gino Whitman in Traction uh, identifies called key issues. So what are the issues that are getting in, in the way of you achieving 90, 100% on your OKRs, your objectives, key objectives and key results, OKRs? John Doerr, I believe, is the guy. Yeah. Um, what's stopping you from getting there? And, and are those issues that you need to, in Gino Whitman's terms, identify, discuss, and, and solve? But then I would, I would also ask your team, hey, guys, what do y'all think about routinely delivering 70 to 80%? That's kind of C to C plus material. Don't you think it's ironic that, that the, the most stringent grading scale is in academics? You know, just by the way, Grace, you're doing that. Oh, yeah. 
recommend a number of day long sessions for the other two months I am I don't know why I'm involved in that, but we're doing day long sessions for about a month. Yeah, very good. Strategic growth intensive September 21st. 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 <laughs> September 21st, strategic growth intensive. We'll be digging into uh the building of strategic growth. We're providing lunch. And we're providing lunch. If well, you if you come here. <laughs> <laughs> No, you're done. So here, here's something I want to throw out to you, a little bit provocative, that we're responsible for our actions. We're responsible for the assets of the organization, the things within the organization, but we're accountable to people. And so therefore, accountability is really about trust and relationships. When, when we're sitting at the leadership team table and I allow my name to be put down by a to-do, a quarterly priority or a rock, as Whitman would call it, then I'm not saying I'm responsible for that thing. I'm saying I'm accountable to making sure that it happens. And there may be some other people that have to have some responsibility in it with me, but I'm the one who's accountable to bring the right people together to make it happen. And so I'm, I'm figuratively and maybe even in actuality, looking everybody in that room in the eye and saying, I got you on this one. That's on me. And so if I fail to do that, or if I fail to, to, to manage the expectations when I run into obstacles and let people know that I'm struggling to deliver what I said when I said, and I just let it blow by and wait till somebody asks me three days later, then I've not managed those expectations. I've not been very accountable. So accountability is really about building and maintaining trust and relationships. Uh, it's it's kind of like the word integrity. You know what the word integrity really means? Now, I'll tell you the, the common definition that I get when I ask that is uh, doing what's right when people would, won't know the difference or when nobody else will know the difference. And, and I say that's cute and it's, it's right, but integrity, the root of the word integrity is about being whole. Think about that. In the medical field, we talk about a bone that's lost its integrity. It's broken or the skin is broken. Um, you think about to integrate something is to bring it together into a whole, to one whole. To disintegrate something is to blow it apart. And so accountability really is an integrity issue. If my words don't match my actions, I'm broken. If my actions don't match my words, I'm broken. I'm not whole. And so I want to really challenge us all to think about this concept of, of accountability as vitally, vitally important in building a culture of excellence within any organization. Thoughts, anybody? Don't be shy. If you have thoughts, you can put them in the chat, not the chat, you can put them in the comments and Monica and team will, will pull up. Or questions. Okay, all right. So let's talk about engaged and committed teammates. <clears throat> you know, there um, was a guy by the name of Katzenbach, uh, Stephen Katzenbach, I believe was his first name, 1993, who wrote The Wisdom of Teams. And while the book is, is, is quite old, it has stood the test of time in, in creating what I think is the absolute best definition of leadership. It's not just the a group of people that you put in close proximity to one another and call them a team. It's a small group of people working with complementary skill, committed to a common purpose, a common uh, set of performance goals, a common approach to their work for which they hold themselves mutually accountable. And all of those things go into creating engaged and committed teammates. If I don't feel like that we're all rallied around the same purpose, I'm not going to be as engaged. If I don't feel like my teammates have the same approach to work that I do, then I'm not going to be as engaged or they're not going to be as engaged. If we don't have clear and consistent performance goals, um, if we don't hold ourselves mutually accountable, and I'm gonna say, well, you know, he didn't deliver what he said he was going to, and nobody chopped his head off, so why do I have to do the same thing? Um, so I encourage you, if you've not read The Wisdom of Teams, uh, you might pull that out. There's another book that's not quite as old. It's a little bit newer, uh, but another book that stood the test of time, and it actually has some Conway roots to it, and that's Real Dream Teams by Bo Thomas and Bob Fisher. Bob Fisher, Bo Thomas, actually. 
Uh, Bob was the Dean of Business at uh, the University of Central Arkansas several years ago. Uh, Bo Thomas was an individual and organizational psychologist here in town. Uh, Bob ended up going to become the president of Belmont University in Nashville, and Bo went there to be his uh, executive VP of development. But they were studying in, in around 1992 to 1995, they were studying teamwork, and they, they took team leaders and team members that ranged from a middle school principal in Arkansas, Arkansas, to a two-star general of the Thunderbirds uh, 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 Air Force, I believe the Thunderbirds Air Force, and Blue Angels and Navy, yeah. So anyway, a fighter jets, right? And everything in between, sports, sports figures, sports coaches, athletes, uh, and, and, and everyone that you can imagine on the spectrum. And they said, tell me about your best team leadership and or teamwork experience, and tell me about your worst teamwork and team leadership. And they looked at all the commonalities of the best experiences, all the commonalities of the worst experiences, and then the differences between the groups of commonalities. And they came up with a book that they called Real Dream Teams. And the reason they named it Dream Teams was because in 1992, while they were doing this research, the U.S. men's basketball team won the gold, the Olympic gold, and became the dream team. And so when they published their book in 2000, uh, 1996, rather, they said, yeah, that was a dream team. Let us tell you the common characteristics of real dream teams. And that's where the title came from. And so you can take a look at this and see that just like Katzenbach, the tip of the sphere is about commitment to a common mission. Knowing where you're going, knowing why you exist, and knowing how you're going to actually get there. And then you begin to look at either side of that tip of the sphere, and you start to have this yin and yang kind of thing, right? Uh, uh, individual confidence. People have to be individually confident. Guess what? Katzenbach said the same thing. But if you just have a bunch of individually competent people without clearly defined and accepted roles, then you have a bunch of competent people stepping all over each other, which is probably going to erode your culture. So you've got this yin and yang of individual competency but within clearly defined and accepted roles. Then you've got mutual respect and encouragement. We treat each other well. We, we, we respect one another. We encourage one another. But we even go a little bit further and actually have win-win cooperation. We don't have win-lose discussions on our team. We have win-win discussions. Everyone walks away feeling like they've been, been heard, feeling like that they've actually won in the conversation, so to speak, if there is even there. And then we have a winning attitude. People have to come to the table with a winning attitude, but we're not going to just stop with it just being an attitude. We're going to carry it further in that they actually have empowering communications. Make sense? And then we have the five dysfunctions of the team, which Patrick Lencioni came back and said, yeah, and here are the reasons that teams get off track. You can have all of those things, but if you don't trust one another, then you won't engage when there's disagreement because you fear conflict. And if you don't engage and really work through your conflicts, then people just won't have the level of commitment because they don't trust each other and they haven't really fleshed through the conflicts that they have, so they just let them fester. So then I'm just not going to be committed. And when I'm not committed, then if I'm not committed, you can't hold me accountable, and that's when the results start to suffer. And so those are the five dysfunctions that are more behavioral versus the team characteristics. So good team leaders not only recognize that they need to have uh, uh, individual competency and clearly defined accepted roles, and then also this culture of communication and mutual respect and, and commitment to a common purpose, but they also understand that they need to do work with their teams to help them get vulnerable with one another, to build a basis of trust, to make it okay to to disagree with one another, to actually push back on group things, so to speak, uh, to, to call out when there looks as though there's a lack of commitment or a lack of engagement, uh, and, and to make sure that uh, there is no avoidance of accountability. Now, take a look at these 13, uh, what, what McKinsey Consulting called the 13 inspiring traits of exceptional leaders. And tell me what you see in common across all of these traits. See anything that sticks out to you? 
scholars. Say again? It's about other people. About other people? Okay. It is, it is about other people. It's about the way a leader treats his or her people. Good. What else? All of them involve some form of communication, right? For, for me to suggest that I trust you to do the job you've been hired to do, I have to demonstrate that to you in some form, which can be verbally or, or another way, but it's in some form of communication. When I find opportunities to let you shine, I'm communicating that, that you deserve the opportunity to be recognized. Uh, when I seek your advice and input, I'm actually listening, which is a form of communication. They all have some form of communication attached to them. You won't know how, how much I care unless I communicate that to you in some way, either verbally or physically, right? And so I want to talk about this concept of empowering communication. Uh, and I've, I've hinted at the definition a few moments ago, but how do you define the word empower? If you empower someone, what do you do? audience participation again. What does it mean to empower someone? You give them the ability to manage a problem themselves. Okay, give them the ability to manage a problem or, or situation or circumstance. Good. What else? That's pretty good. Any others? So I like to define empowering is to make someone stronger and more confident. To make someone stronger and more confident in managing the event or the circumstances surrounding them. Think about that for a moment. Meant to make someone strong. So what our, our mission of the conductor is to empower existing and aspiring entrepreneurs and small business leaders. So we want to make them stronger and more confident in dealing with the circumstances or managing the circumstances that they find themselves in relative to their business predominantly. Disempower then, by converse, would be to make someone weaker and less confident, right? So if we if, if we do the opposite of empowering someone, the opposite of making them stronger and more confident, then we make them weaker and less confident. Here's an inconvenient truth is that empowering communication, consistent empowering communication is hard, even when all the circumstances fall in my favor. It's even harder today because of the noise that's out there. Think about that for a moment. You know, in, in elementary school or junior high or whatever it was, all my school run together. So I mean, I actually learned this. But wouldn't it be great if it were as easy as we used to learn? You know, the three, there are three elements to communication. There's the sender, the receiver, and the message. Oh, oh wow. How cool is that? Right? But it's not like this anymore. It's more like this. There's just so much noise. We've got all this stuff in our heads, these file folders, these filters, so to speak, like just time, space, matter, and energy. Maybe our energy is down today because we don't feel well. Maybe something's happened. Maybe we're pressed for time, so we're not processing. Maybe we've just gotten bored. Maybe there are language barriers. And it could be foreign language barriers. It could just be uh, verbiage barriers, right? Memories. I did this one time and it resulted in that. So now I have a filter that I'm going to, going to run everything through before I make a decision. Past decisions, I made this decision and that happened. Meta programs, the self-talk, the things that we're constantly telling ourselves and the programs, what we believe at the core of who we are, um, our values and beliefs. Uh, our attitudes, our worldviews, our religious worldviews, our political worldviews, our cultural worldviews, all of those things create this enormous ability for all of us to delete, distort, generalize communications with folks. How many times have you ever been involved in a conversation with someone? It might have been a difficult conversation or, or a tense conversation. And, and when it was repeated back to you hours, days, maybe weeks later, the words were different than the words that were actually exchanged. Well, that's what's going on. You might have said this word, and the person heard a completely different word. And oh, by the way, they attached deep meaning to that word that they heard that you may have never even said. 
So if you think about that, we've got spoken words. So just the actual words we use. We've got tone of voice. Many times that tone of voice can also result in a, in a transliteration of words, so to speak. We've got body language, arms crossed, legs crossed, towering, right? Um, text and emails. How many of you have ever heard someone get really, really angry because of a text message that they got or an email that they got and they placed emotional value on that when it was just words? There were no text, there were no uh, cat, all caps, there were no emoji. There were no exclamation points. It was just words. And I or you or someone you know interpreted it extremely negatively just based on the words. So it wasn't the words. It wasn't the tone of voice, the body language that that person had when they typed those words because I can't see them. All the interpretation took place right here in my head. But it happens. And it makes it much, much more difficult to have empowering communication or the absence of communication. I sent you a text and I immediately saw the text bubble that you were texting me back, but you didn't text me back for three hours. So therefore, I place value on that or lack of value, and I'm judging the fact that you're ignoring me. Am, am I just speaking on a term here? Do y'all sound? I see some head nodding. There, do you feel me on this one? Yeah, good. Okay, great. So Lou Holtz had what he called the do-right rule. Sorry, makes me mad. <laughs> Lou Holtz had what he called the do-right rule. He said that there are really only three questions uh, that uh, are or three rules, rather, that we need to have as we live. Uh, and those three rules are, number one, do the right thing always. Just do what's right. <clears throat> number two, he said, do everything that you can to the best of your ability within the time that you have to do it. Or within the allotted time. And then he said the third rule you need is just show people you care. Because if you do those three things, do the right thing, do everything to the best of your ability within the time allotted, and show people you care, then you proactively answer the three questions that everyone's asking when they come into contact with someone new. And those three questions are, number one, can I trust you? Number two, are you committed to excellence? And number three, do you care about me? And so if I live my life using the do right rules of Lou Holtz, then I'm going to proactively answer those questions so that you're not going to have those questions when you come into contact. You're going to know that I'm going to, that you can trust me. You're going to know that I'm committed to excellence because I do the best of my ability within the time allotted. And you're going to know that I care about you because I show that proactively. And that can go a long way in establishing the foundation for empowering communication. At the end of the day, we're asking the question, do I believe that you have an authentic desire for my well-being? Even in a tough conversation, if I believe that you have, you know, I used to have a, a person I worked with, she was about 15 years my senior, and she would, she would have a feedback session with me and literally serve my head up on a platter to me, and I would walk out saying, thank you. Because I knew, even though she might deliver some very tough feedback to me, I knew that she had an authentic desire for my well-being, both as a person and also as a professional colleague. So let's talk about some empowering communications just on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I, I talk about Stephen Covey a lot. Stephen Covey wrote the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, and his son, uh, Stephen M. R. Covey, wrote the book, uh, uh, The Speed of Trust, where they both talk about this concept of the emotional bank account. Imagine your checking account. If you put more money into your checking account than you draw out, you're in good shape, right? But if you make more withdrawals than you make deposits, what happens? You get the big OD, right? Overdrawn. You get overdrawn. And what happens when you get overdrawn? It shuts down. All transactions stop. And, and so Stephen Covey Sr. used to say, you know, treat everyone as though they have an emotional bank account and make more deposits into those accounts than you make withdrawals. In other words, give to the relationships, 
more than you expect in return, and you'll never be overdrawn with people. That was kind of his premise. In the speed of trust, Stephen M. R. Covey went on to say, and when you do get overdrawn, transactions shut down and you actually end up paying a trust tax. He actually called it a trust tax because they're, they're questioning whether they can trust you and things just take a whole lot longer to get progress done because I, you're overdrawn in my, in my emotional bank account. So make more deposits than you make withdrawal. Actively listen to both the spoken and the unspoken words. Uh, Covey's another one, another one of his habits was seek first to understand before you seek to be understood. Uh, I'm, I'm a, you know, if you disagree with me, it's it's clearly ignorance. So spend a little more time with me, and I'll educate. Now, I'm being a little bit facetious about the point, but in my early days, that's kind of you know what my mo was. Right? And, and fortunately, I was surrounded by a number of very seasoned uh, leaders who could put a mirror up in front of me and say, is that really the way you want to go? You know, go at this. So seek first to understand before you seek to be understood. Practice accountability as an act of submission before you feel the need to practice it as an act of assertion. Create that culture where people feel vulnerable, confident, and comfortable in, in submitting them. You know, I, I never will forget it. I went from becoming a, a respiratory therapist to a professor of respiratory therapy to uh, a, a young executive at, at Axiom Corporation. And I never will forget one of the very first leadership meetings I was in. The lady for whom I worked, uh, we were in a meeting and, and she said, uh, forget what, I don't remember the exact circumstance, but something didn't go as we planned. And in front of that meeting, she said, well, yeah, that's on me. That was a leadership failure on my part. And I was taken back. I had never, ever, ever heard a leader be that vulnerable in front of the people that reported to him or her, ever. You certainly never heard that at UAMS when I was a professor there. The dean would have never said that. Not saying that that doesn't happen in other institutions, but the dean that I work for would have never said that. But her immediate response was, yeah, that's a leadership failure on my part. I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I'll get that correct. Practice accountability as an act of submission. Assume positive intent until proven otherwise. Uh, our, our business partners up in Fayetteville, Startup Junkie Consulting, Jeff Amaran, probably one of the best at doing this that I've ever seen. It doesn't matter if the world's falling down around him at the hands of one individual person. He will say, you know, I'm going to assume positive intent until I have proof that it's something otherwise. Sorry, I made you bad too. <laughs> Thank you. To <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, refuse to place intent, emotion, or tone on a written text or email. Just, just refuse. But you know, and then go back to, to point number four. Assume positive intent until proven otherwise. Now, if you call and say, "Hey, can we talk about the text message?" and they start lambasting you, okay, then maybe you were right. But you've got proof at that point, right? So refuse to place that intent or emotional report. And then uh, Voltaire once said, everything that's said must always be truthful, but not everything that's truthful must always be said. Sometimes we just don't, sometimes, yeah, it's truthful, but sometimes we just don't have to say it because we know it's going to create division. Empowering communication. So when we think about, uh, we've talked about this concept of situational leadership. Well, how does empowering communication fit within the model of situational leadership? And I'll give you uh, these, that there are four different ways that leaders generally make decisions. You may not have thought about it in these terms, but uh, when we think about situational leadership, there's also situational decision-making. And each of these can be done in a way that, that is an empowering way to make decisions and communicate those decisions. The first is command which is very direct. So if we think about the directing behaviors of situational leadership, command decisions, that's where I'm going to make the decision and I'm going to tell you what we're, what we're doing. Generally, when the risks are high or I don't think there's consensus among the team, very few and far between, hopefully I don't make a habit of doing that, but in the military many times, there are command decisions. In other paramilitary organizations, uh, law enforcement organizations, fire, fire organizations, 
uh, and others. They will make command decisions, very leader centric. I'm going to make the decision and I'm going to tell you what we've decided. The second way is collaborative, where I'm going to still make the decision, but I'm going to pull my team together and I'm going to say, hey guys, I've got a decision to make here. But before I make that decision, I want to get everyone's feedback. And, and I, want, I want to hear what you think about the situation and what you think we ought to do. And I stop short of saying, and I'm going to give you the decision making authority. I'm still going to make the decision. It's collaborative, not consensual. We'll move to consensual next. So command decision, I make the decision. I'll tell you what it is. Collaborative, hey guys, let's get together. I need your feedback because I've got a decision to make. Consensual, hey guys, we've got a situation and I want us all to make a good decision. So let's talk about it. Well, what I'm hearing is consensus around perhaps doing something like this. Am I getting that right? You agree? You agree? Anybody disagree? Okay, consensually, then this is what we're going to do. That's consensual. See the difference between consensual and collaborative? And then finally, convenience. Hey, Grace, I trust you. You go make that decision. Let me know how I can help. So if you think about plotting those up against uh, the leadership uh, uh, continuum there of command, collaborative, consensus, and convenience. Questions? The last thing I want to leave you with is, okay, then what, ha what happens when it hits the fan and you've got to have a tough conversation with someone? Um, first of all, and I, I, just as a review, is when we're talking about situational leadership, don't forget this concept of verbally contracting on the front end, this concept of, of what kind of leadership you need from me. So I'm going to give you a new task or you're going to take on a new area of responsibility. What kind of leadership do you need? And you guys are coming to a verbally negotiated contract, so to speak. And I use the word contract, it sounds real legal, but basically you just come to a verbal agreement of what kind of leadership they need and what kind of leadership you feel like they need. And you just match those two up in a very overt fashion. The second thing is that when you must coach someone, you must have a difficult conversation with someone. Take a few moments to step back and remind yourself that when this conversation is over, I want them thinking more about their behavior than I want them thinking about my behavior. And I promise you, just taking 30 seconds to, to think about that and to remind yourself of that will cause you to enter into that conversation with a completely different disposition and perhaps an even different countenance. Um, I can point to some times where I didn't do that and I lost the, the quote unquote moral high ground on the issue because I behaved badly in the way I confronted the issue. I was still right, and I'm not saying that in jest. I was still right with regard to the issue, but because of the way I presented or started that conversation, I lost the right to stand on the issue because I behaved badly. So I encourage you to think about that. I want them to walk away from this conversation thinking more about the situation or their behavior than they walk out of here thinking about my behavior. And then this concept of feedback without fallout. 2000, probably 2000, uh, I would have been about 34 or so and a young executive uh, in a growing uh, organization. Uh, I had been appointed the business unit leader over uh, three groups of associates, uh, of which I was a team leader over one third. Now I became the business unit leader over all three thirds. And two of those people overnight went from being my, my peers to reporting to me. So a little bit of an awkward situation just as, as it is. One of those persons, quite frankly, at that point in time, she was 10 years my senior and she was probably would have been a better choice for that decision to lead that group at that time. But our leader saw something in me and told me later that she saw something from the for the future where she thought I had potential that she wanted to invest in. But uh, this lady worked for me for about three months following that. And about a month in, she came into my office one day, she knocked on the door and she said, may I give you some feedback? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, 
And she said, I'd like to share with you what I'm observing. I'd like to tell you how it makes me feel. And then I'd like to share with you the impact that it's having. And then I want to give you a chance to respond and talk about it with them. So uh, she, she did that. I said, okay, yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's have that conversation. She said, when I come in and sit down with you for a weekly touch base, and I'm going through my projects, my workflows, where I'm having bottlenecks, where I've got issues, where I need some support, I begin to observe a tilting of the head, a glazing over of the eyes, and I begin to observe a frequent checking of the watch. It makes me feel like my job's not important. It makes me feel like I'm not really a valued member of the team, and it makes me want to look for a job somewhere else. The impact it's having is I've floated my resume, and I've got two interviews, one tomorrow and one next day. Now I'd like to give you a chance to respond. <laughs> and that's exactly the way she put it out. Uh, my immediate, if someone asked me, um, did you feel yourself getting defensive when she was saying that? And, and my response was, I wanted to get defensive, but she did such a masterful job of setting up that conversation and laying it out. She took every arrow out of my quiver. I was defenseless. I couldn't get defensive because she handled that conversation so well. And so over the years, I've processed what she did and how she handled that conversation. And, and I'll tell you, she changed my life as a leader. Literally changed my life as a leader. What did she do? She planned ahead. She planned ahead. She knew what the agenda she needed to have would be in order to produce the, the appropriate response. She said, I want to share with you what I'm observing. May I give you uh, feedback? I want to share what I'm observing, tell you how it makes me feel, share the impact that it's having, and then give you a chance to respond so we can discuss it. So she planned ahead. She also uh, asked for my permission. Had I started arguing with her, she could have said, you, you, you gave me permission. You know, I, I asked for your permission, and you said yes. Are you now revoking that permission? <laughs> so she, she, she knew what she was doing. She owned the agenda. Had I started trying to recant, trying to recant, or trying to buddy, and she could have said, no, wait a minute, you agreed to the agenda, and we're not to your part yet. So she owned the agenda, which required her to plan ahead. She spoke factually, and or at least observational. Who am I to argue with what she's observing? I observe this, I observe that, and I observe that. She didn't say, you do this, you do this, and you do that. But that would have been accusatory, right? She spoke from the perspective of her observations and how it made her feel, right? She used I and me messages back to not saying you. You is accusatory. You do this, right? No, she said, I observe this. It makes me feel that way. The impact it's having on me is this. I don't feel, I feel like I want to look for a job somewhere else. I floated my resume, et cetera. So she used I and me, which can be a little unnatural. It can be unnatural to say it, it can be a little unnatural to hear it, but it absolutely removes the arrows from the conversation. She spoke only for herself. She spoke only for herself. She didn't say, you know, there are a bunch of members, a bunch of people on the team who, who think that you don't respect them. I would have said, well, tell a lot of people to come see. And I would I would have found a way to discount what she was saying because she she spoke, if you have to speak on behalf of other people, then your argument is not strong enough. It's not strong enough. So wait until your argument is strong enough and then have the conversation versus watering it down by trying to speak on behalf of other people. Because when people would come into my office and they would try to speak on behalf of other people, I said, well, listen, who's, who said that? Well, well, just some people. What? Which people? Well, so, well then let's get Sally in here. Let's talk to her and see. I'll, I'll hear it from her. Oh, no, no, no. People learn very quickly. Don't come into my office dropping names and speaking on behalf of other people because I just get them in there and talk about it. So I just reiterate if you feel like you've got to speak on behalf of someone else, then just wait to have the conversation until your argument's strong enough. It'll go much, much better. And then finally, she allowed for dialogue and discussion and, and resolution. And now, she ultimately went on to go to work somewhere else, but we had a very, very productive working relationship between that time and and you know, and I, I was I was humiliated, I was embarrassed, and I told her that. I said, you know, I, I'm sorry, that is not the kind of environment that I want to create. Um, 
I can't promise you it's going to change tomorrow because that's clearly a bad habit or a set of bad habits. But I can commit to you that you have my permission to always hold me accountable and don't let me do that. Bring it to my knees, which she did on a couple more occasions. So I encourage you guys to think about this concept of feed, what I call feedback without fallout. Plan ahead, have the agenda, own the agenda, ask for permission, speak factually or observationally from your perspective. Don't speak on behalf of other people. Use I and me messages and allow for dialogue, discussion, and ultimately resolution. So questions, comments, observations. We talked about this concept of a culture of excellence. Strong leadership, clarity and focus in terms of where we're going, who we are, and where we're going. Engaged and committed teammates, empowering communication, 100% accountability, and organizational agility. We didn't talk really about organizational agility today, but that's just the ability to bounce back after unforeseen circumstances. Uh, we can certainly talk about that at some point if you guys want. I've got a question. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Would you rather, I feel like all the situational decision making? Um, as far as from a leadership standpoint, I'm pretty good at collaborative and supporting. I'm weakest at delegating and command. Would you recommend, if you were leading a team, would you recommend trying to only bring team members on that fit my leadership style, or would you recommend that I get better at the other two? I, so when it comes to situational leadership, I recommend that you get better at the other two because we all need to be able to flex among those kind of four elements of leadership and decision making, right? Uh, now, that being said, you may be always be stronger at one or two than the other two or three. And so, yeah, certainly bringing people into your team who can help complement those weaknesses, absolutely. But you shouldn't use that as an excuse to not try to get better at the ones where you're a little bit, a little bit weak. Just because, you know, you may find yourself in a situation where those people aren't around that particular week or that particular day, and you got to be direct or you got to make a command decision. In some instances, it could be the difference between your business succeeding and your business failing. So it's kind of both pain. Good question. Anybody else? That's my contact information, my email, my mobile number. If I can help any of you guys at all, follow up questions, uh, feedback, if you have that. Uh, challenge me on any of these things. I'd love to hear that too. Uh, just be sure you take my arrows away or I'll get pinned. <laughs> uh, but I appreciate you guys for coming and thanks for participating in our conductor events. So. <laughs>